We spent the last couple weeks kind of tearing apart, I guess, for lack of a better term, kind of tearing apart some of the, the, the falsehoods that we tend to believe and accept as believers. We, we looked at a couple weeks ago uh, the, the notion, uh, the idea that, uh, that we believe, well, God won't give you more than you can handle, and that's what, what, what we'll confess and hold on to when it seems like things get heavy in life and things keep kind of hitting us. Well, we feel like, well, God must think I'm pretty strong because he keeps piling stuff on. But you know that the scripture that's taken from has really nothing to do with that. It's talking about that God will allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, saying that he won't allow the enemy to push you to where you have no choice but to sin. That, that, that's, that's what he does. In fact, what we, we find, I mean, maybe this isn't encouraging, that God often gives you more than you can handle because he wants to work with you. He wants you to live a life where you need him. And so he likes to bring things. I'm not talking about uh, destruction. He doesn't bring destruction to your life. We, we find that well enough on our own, uh, as well as just kind of being in a messed up world and with messed up people around us, and, and junk happens. So God doesn't bring junk to your life, but he does bring visions and plans and dreams and opportunities that are way bigger than you because he wants to partner with you. He's shown that throughout his word, beginning to end. He's always wanting to partner with his people. He always wants to join together with them to take territory. He wants to join together with you to see big dreams happen. So he will bring things that are bigger than you can handle on purpose. Amen? Yeah, only a few of you are excited about that part. Okay. <laughs> and then we looked at last week uh, the, the idea that, that it's, it's important to not be those that are always following open doors. Well, God opens doors and he closes doors. And the doors he opens, uh, if, he, if he closes the door, they say he'll open a window. Right? We say all sorts of things, and, and so uh, this is uh, taken out of, actually in the book of Revelation, it was the, the, the verse that's used uh, to kind of back up that line of thinking uh, is actually talking to the church in Philadelphia. It was one of the letters to the seven churches in the, in the book of Revelation, and it was encouraging them in their salvation that Jesus has opened up a door that no one can close, right? That there's, that when, when our, when our uh, relationship with Father God or lack of which was based upon our own righteousness, the door could be closed. But now if we'll stand on the righteousness of Christ, no one can close that door. And that there were doors that were closed. In fact, at the time of the garden, the fall of man, that door to the Father was closed and no one could open it. You couldn't be good enough to get that door open. Amen? Amen. Okay, just check and make sure you knew that. Nobody could be good enough to get that door open by themselves. Jesus is the only one that opens it. But God does open doors. We talked about last week. He does open and close doors in our life. And it becomes important for us to recognize when it's something that he's opening up and when it's not. That sometimes doors close in our lives because he's closed them. Sometimes they close just because things close. Sometimes things happen to us not because it's part of God's divine plan, but it's just part of life. And it's part of us learning to rely on him. And the reality is that the majority of the doors he will open in your life begin with him opening doors inside of you. There are things inside of you that need to be opened up to prepare you for the next physical door he wants to open in your life. He prepares you for the door he's opening up. Sometimes you don't recognize that the preparation has anything to do with the door. The example we looked at last week was King David, uh, that, that he was a shepherd working out in a field, being really despised by the rest of his brothers and kind of pushed aside. And he's just out working in the fields when the prophet comes to 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 uh, t talk to Jesse's sons to find out which one's going to be the king. They didn't even consider him. He's just out in the fields working. The other brothers had all become ceremonially clean, worked, went through all the works and all the process of being worthy to stand before the prophet and to be chosen, and they were all rejected. David, who was out working, what was he doing in the field? He was being a shepherd, right? That's what God's looking for in leaders. He's looking for a shepherd, and so that's what David was. And not only that, he spent time out there. He had to fight a bear and a lion with his own hands. Well, that was preparing him for the day he was going to face Goliath. Right? There, was, there were the years that he spent between the time he was told he would be the king and the time he actually became king. And he spent time learning that perseverance and that honor and the loyalty and the, and the reliance upon God to prepare him for what God had. There are doors inside of you that need to be opened up for you to begin to see and look at things differently than you have before to prepare you for what he has for you next. That you can't get to where he wants you to go thinking like you think today. You can't get there doing the things you do today and having the habits that you have today. He wants to open up some doors in your life to get you ready for what he has for you next. And when he has prepared you, then he'll open the next door. Now, granted, there are times he opens that door before you think you're ready, 
but he knows you're ready. Amen? All right, so that's where we've been the last couple of weeks. But what we're going to look at today, and, and I believe it's going to carry over into next week, uh, is, is understanding who our enemy is, what power we want to say he does have and what he doesn't have, and most importantly, why. And so we're going to look at this because I think there's a lot of misconception uh, on either end of the spectrum in Christianity about what authority Satan has in your life. You have one side that thinks Satan's doing everything, and everything that's going on, Satan's causing all kinds of things. Uh, so we have that side, but we have the other side that says, well, well, Satan's defeated, so he can't do anything in your life. And so reality, right, all of us living in reality look at, go, well, neither one of those things seem true. Neither one of those things seem, seem to be the truth. If, if Satan has no authority, then there's a whole lot of junk going on in my life, and where's it coming from? Right, so we want to get some, some understanding on how these things work. And so to get some understanding, we kind of got to go back to, well, the beginning for us. Going back into the garden in the fall and what happened. And we're going to start tearing into some scripture here to see what, what Jesus has done to change what happened in the garden. But what began in the garden at the fall is there were a couple different things that happened. I think most of us, if we, if we were to you were to be asked, well, what happened? What was, what was the fall about in the garden? Well, it was man sinned. And when man sinned, then he was separated from God. And, and this is true, that, that God had told Adam and Eve, if you ate of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that there would be death that would come upon you. And so perhaps it was looked at that, well, did God know what he's talking about? He ate, they ate of that tree and they didn't instantly die. But they did, because there was a spiritual death that took place when that fruit was eaten. It was, a, it was a decision that, that Adam and Eve made to be ruled by the flesh and what the mind thought and logic as opposed to just trusting in what God said. And so the spirit in us, in man, had died. And without spirit, we weren't who we truly are. But there's always, always a, 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 a desire for people to find out, who am I? Especially kids, they graduate high school and they go to college and they're going to they're gonna learn who they are. And, and, and for you as parents, this is so important to instill great information to your kids before they go to college, right? Because when they get to college, there's going to be some other information that's going to be downloaded into them that's probably not going to be what you want them to be receiving. Now, maybe you get, I'm going to, you know, I, I've stopped confessing that over my kids because we've always spoken over our kids. They've always, we've always had our kids in public schools. People wonder, well, you're a pastor. Do you homeschool? You know, your wife's a teacher. Maybe do you homeschool? Do you put them in Christian school? I said, no. I teach my kids. I train them up in a way to go, and I send them out in the world to be a light where they go. Right? Now, that, every, every family's different. I'm, a, I'm not condemning you if you think differently. But for, for my house, that's how we've always been. But we've always spoken that even though they're in a public school, they're always going to get good teachers. And you know what? They always do. They always get the good Christian teacher. They always get the good, you know, they, they, the ones that aren't going to fill their heads full of all that garbage. But it's going to take some extra faith because they're going to go to college now. But understanding that, that we're always looking for who we are. And, but we're defining who we are by the flesh or by the soul, but who we are is spirit. So you aren't even who you are until you receive Jesus. When you get Jesus, now the spirit of God is inside of you, and now you become who you truly are. And so Adam and Eve actually lost who they were at the fall. That there was, there, was a, there was a fall, there was a death that came because the spirit, who they truly were, was no longer there anymore, the spirit of God in them. And so this is part of the fall, was a sin, but there was also a transfer of authority that took place. And this is where the enemy got his little claws or whatever into, into this earth. And that is that the authority was given to Adam and Eve to rule this earth. First thing God told him to do is to, to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, right? Take control, control this earth. Well, this authority went over to Satan when, when the fall took place. So then Satan ruled this earth for a long time. Now it feels like he still does, but you know that we have now through what Christ Jesus did the potential to take that authority back. But there's an authority that he exercised for a good 4,000 years until Jesus came and, and took care of his work, which we're going to look at what he did in just a minute. But there was a loss of authority. So not just that sin and death entered the world, and not just that authority was lost, but it was a hopeless situation in that it couldn't change. 
There was nothing that man could do that was going to change that situation. And so we were kind of subject to what, how Satan is going to rule the earth. And, you know, it looked pretty bad. In fact, by the time of the days of Noah, it said that every man on earth had nothing but evil thought. Everything contrary to God. He can only find one man, Noah, who he could find as a, as a righteous man to start the whole thing over again. But you know what? Even after he starts it over again with a righteous man and his family, it doesn't take long for it to get bad again. Why? Because of man and his fallen state. And so there was a hopelessness that came, a loss of authority, the death entered the world. But let's go look at now what, uh, if you'll turn over to Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to begin looking at how God fixed the situation. Jesus did a work for us that we call a, a substitutionary sacrifice. It's a good religious sounding term, but what does it mean? Well, it was a sacrifice that was made that was a direct substitution for you, and for me. That there was a sacrifice that had to be made to pay a price to restore the relationship, to take the authority back from the enemy. But again, as I said earlier, it was hopeless. The man couldn't do it on his own. So God comes, Jesus comes, takes the form of man, and makes the sacrifice for us, a substitutionary sacrifice. And it becomes... Well, we have to understand it's substitutionary, so that means there's nothing that I bring to the table in this, that I don't have to bring my sacrifice, right? This is what the, what the law had them do, is to bring sacrifice. It was a picture of what was to come. But we don't bring a sacrifice to restore, that Jesus brought the entire sacrifice. You know that, that God didn't need that sacrifice. Jesus didn't need that sacrifice. In fact, when the fall came, it wasn't God who was defeated, it was us are quiet on that. But, the, but it is God who looked at our condition. I will say it was, it was a defeat to God in that the relationship was broken. But it was, it was us who was defeated. And it was a hopeless defeat. There wasn't, we come back next week and we'll just, we'll just win the next one. Once we had lost, we were lost. Until Jesus comes and does his work. So let's begin looking at a bit of what he did. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 I love the, the book of Hebrews. In fact, uh, a couple of pastor friends and I, we've been talking a lot lately about our, our theories about who wrote Hebrews, because we don't know who wrote Hebrews. There's some people who think it was Paul, or some people think it was Apollos. There's, there's all kinds of uh, ideas across the spectrum, because it doesn't tell us who wrote Hebrews. Uh, even, I've even heard and read an actual pretty interesting theory that maybe um, the Priscilla had even written Hebrews. One of, one of, the, uh, one of Paul's was actually a woman Right, I thought they were supposed to be quiet. I don't know. I guess maybe that was misunderstood, wasn't it? All right, Hebrews chapter 2. So, uh, verse 14. Inasmuch, then, as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. He shared his flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So, through what Jesus did in his we partake in his flesh and blood. Right? We, I'm not just talking about physically when we receive communion. I'm talking about when we receive Jesus, you receive his flesh, you receive his blood. When we, when we receive communion, oftentimes I'll talk about the reason we do that is to remind us of what we've done spiritually in receiving the flesh and blood of Jesus. His flesh that was, that was laid down for us, the sacrifice that he made, his blood and what that means, it, that is, it is a cleansing blood, it is, a, it is a, a covenant sealing blood, right? that we receive those things. When we partake of that, we're partaking of what he himself did. He, he gave his flesh and his blood so that through his death, you know that, that our death does nothing to pay the price for man's condition. One of the reasons is, is that I think that so often, and, and I, don't wanna, I don't have my wife here to give me the nod when she knows I'm getting off on a, on a tangent, but we have to understand that so much of our, of our Christian thinking and what we do is focused on and emphasized on the action of sin and trying to stop sin and thinking this is what we have to do to make God happy is that we need to quit sinning and then he'll be happy with us. And if we sin, now he's mad at us. 
And, 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 and you know, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a father who loves us unless we didn't listen to him and now he's angry with us. And once we fix it all, then he'll be happy with us again. And we may not think of it in those exact terms, but that's how we tend to, to treat our relationship with God. And that the reality is, is that, that God hates sin because of what sin produces. But what, what he is more, was more concerned with and what the sacrifice is for was the hopelessness aspect of it. That we who, all who descended from Adam were born a sinner. No choice. That's how we were born. You weren't born perfect as a child, and at some point then you sinned, and now you're a sinner. Right? Some kids might make it. Well, I don't think any make it past two. <laughs> right? we, we, you do, we weren't born perfect, and then you sinned and blew it. We were all born as part of our DNA, part of who we are as mankind with a sin nature. And God's concern was with the hopelessness that that brought. That no matter how hard you could try, you're still going to sin. You're still going to bring destruction to your life because of sin. And that he's, you know, when we look at the idea, and I think why it creates a lot of confusion, I think, among believers, and especially those on the, on the fringe and the outside. Those people who want to believe, but they tend to look at what we believe and kind of wonder about it. Okay, so we sing, he's a good, good father. Unless you sin, unless you sin. No, that's not it, is it? But we look at it, well, he's a good father, but what good father would now reject his kids because they didn't do something he asked them to do? Like, what, what one of us with our children would do that? And so we create some confusion. We get focused on sin. How many know that what you focus on, then you do? Right, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7, that when you, when you emphasize sin, then you get drawn to it like a magnet. God doesn't want us emphasizing sin. We ought to be trying to get it out of our life. But the, way, the best way to get it out of our life is to draw closer to God. But right? it's kind of like, like when you bring, you know, the Holy Spirit comes to us as like a refining fire. What happens when you come closer to that fire, the junk begins to burn off of you. Right? Sometimes it's a little uncomfortable to have some of the old junk burn off of you. There are some things that have been part of you for a long time that need to get burned off, but you, know, but you couldn't do it. When you continue to think that God's still a little bit mad at me because I still deal with this. And I, you know, I'm, I'm your pastor, but I'll be, I'll be transparent with you. I, I still, you, know, you have those moments where you go, seriously, I still deal with this? Why, why, I've been saved for how many years? I'm a pastor for crying out loud. But we get focused on, but what we have to understand is that as we're drawing closer to him, those things are beginning to melt off. When I, get my, when I put my emphasis on condemning myself because I failed again, right, we're, God's looking at you going, I'm, I'm not mad at you. I knew you were going to do that. I love you anyway. Just let's, let's keep working on it. We're going to work on it, but let's keep going. I can't help you if you keep turning away from me. Every time you fail, this is one of the lies, if, if we want to get into one of the powers that the enemy has, is to bring condemnation to your life and separate you from God. There is nothing, what Paul said, that can now separate you from the love of God. Even your own mistakes, even your own sin. They're not, God, trust me, God's not happy that you sin. No, no, no way, shape, or form. You shouldn't be happy when you sin. But don't let it condemn you and separate you. But that's the lie the enemy wants to bring to you. So what, through what Jesus did, it says that he broke off this power and he destroyed him that had the power of death. And just in case you didn't know who he was talking about, that is the devil. The Satan had the power of death. That's power he had over man because of man's choice to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? That was the decision that, that gave him that authority. It was authority that... that Adam had that was transferred over to Satan. But let's go look at a couple more pieces because that's only the first one. Go over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, and we'll start at verse 11. It says, In him... You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And you made a decision at the moment you received Jesus to now switch gears from what Adam and Eve did. Adam and Eve were 
controlled by the Spirit, but made a decision now to be controlled by the flesh. They're saying, when you receive Jesus, you've made a decision to say, now I am going to be ruled again by the Spirit, not by the desires of the flesh. But how many know some doesn't mean the desires of the flesh go away? Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect and never sin again, right? Sometimes we, we, we read these things or we've had things preached to us or, or taught to us that, well, if you, if you receive Jesus, but then you still sin and, and, and sometimes you actually like doing it, that maybe you, you aren't saved. But we are in a process of putting off that work. But, you know, we've had a whole lifetime of training of being ruled that way, and it takes time and it takes effort to, can, to learn how to be ruled differently. Right? It doesn't happen instantly. But we are in the process. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, we were buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of, of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all the trespasses that you're really sorry for and you didn't mean to do. Does your Bible have those extra words? I don't know if anybody has one of those weird Bibles. No, it's all your trespasses were forgiven in Christ. All right, does it make them okay? Right? How many know that when you forgive, this is a lesson you can learn when you're trying to deal with forgiving somebody in your life, when you forgive, isn't a stamp of approval to say what somebody did was okay. It says, I've chosen to forgive. But right? God has forgiven all your trespasses. It isn't God saying, I'm okay with everything you've done, but it's God saying, I have forgiven you for everything you have done. All, not with, an, not with an asterisk where you had to go down and read the, the legal fine print to find out what things might not be forgiven. But everything is a trespass where you disobeyed God, whether you knew you were doing it, whether you didn't know you were doing it, right? where all your trespasses are forgiven if you, if you will receive what Christ has done. It says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, uh, Paul talks about, uh, over in the book of Romans, I believe in Galatians as well, that, that he didn't put aside the requirements of the law to say you shouldn't live like that anymore. He put them aside as the means of you being connected to God. The, the, that the law and the requirements are no longer the means that you follow in order to be, have a relationship with God. He nailed that to the cross because, you know, that was also hopeless for us. That just, just the 613 commands that God gave Moses, take it down to the 10 he started with. None of us keeps all the 10. Nobody does it. Like, well, I think I do it pretty good. Let me think for a minute. No, you know, we don't. Jesus boiled it down for us. They asked him, what's the most important law? He says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And you're like, yes, I love the Lord God with all my heart. No, you don't. Let's just be honest. We're human. We don't. And then we're supposed to love other people that same. Well, we, didn't even, we didn't get the first part right. And then we're supposed to do the second part. None of us are doing it. Right? We can't. It, we're continuing to strive to improve and become better and better. But we don't ever let that be our connection to God. It's the cross is our connection. Now, Jesus took that requirement of our perfection. He nailed it to the cross. Right? He, he, he put that to death. That is no longer our means. You know, and God knew we couldn't do it because he provided within the law the sacrifices to be made that you would do because you didn't follow the law. He, well, he's a good father. He knew that even though they couldn't keep all the rules, he provided that sin sacrifice each year to make up for the fact that, guess what? You're going to mess up. Okay, let's keep going. So he wiped that out. Verse 15, having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. So he disarmed the principal. What are the principalities he's talking about? The enemy. He's talking about Satan. He has disarmed him. So this, to this idea that Satan is a defeated foe and he's been disarmed, and we're not going to get to too much of this here today, actually not much of it at all. Even though he's disarmed, he's been defeated it sure seems like he gets a lot done for being disarmed and defeated, right? Those of you 
right? We had our, our, our military veterans here today. You, if you knew you're going against an enemy who is disarmed and already defeated, you probably go into that battle a little differently than you would going up against an opponent that you feel is well-armed, maybe even armed better than you. And I think sometimes we're going up against Satan with a belief that he outguns us. We're going up against him with a belief that we're outnumbered, that we have no hope. We have to understand he is a defeated foe, and sometimes we got to remind him that he's a defeated foe. And we got to remember that he has already been disarmed. We can convince ourselves. You know that there were times in the Old Testament where, the, where God shows us really the way we ought to be thinking on this, that he would have the enemy be confused and turn and fight themselves to, to, a, a, as a way of delivering his people. But you know, the, the same thing can happen in inverse if we don't get our thinking right. That we defeat ourselves because we believe the enemy is so much stronger than he is. So we'll, we'll look at that more in detail next week. But let's keep going. Uh, uh, you know, verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink. So it's interesting, this is not a non sequitur. This is a continuation of the process of what he's already been talking about here. So all these requirements that's been nailed to the cross, it is not, this is not your means of righteousness anymore. So because of that, don't let someone judge you in your food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And so he's pointing out, and he's going to go on and continue to, to hit some of these things that, that they, were being, they were having rules be put on them and say, okay, well, you can, you can believe in Jesus, but you better keep doing these things. It's actually really funny when you read the epistles in the New Testament, you find there's a little bit of back and forth between some of the disciples. Paul came along with his revelation that, uh, of the, the grace that comes by what Jesus did. And so he took, we read about this in the book of Acts, where he, he brings his revelation to Peter and James and John. And Peter didn't want to go along with this at first. And eventually he goes, okay, Paul, we'll, we'll let the Gentiles in. They don't need to get circumcised. And all the Gentiles were like, good. Don't need circumcision. Don't, okay, you don't do that. But they need to make sure they don't eat food offered to idols. It's like he had to keep one little rule in there somewhere. All right, I'll let you have that, but we got to have a couple rules they have to follow. There's got to be at least a couple. And so you begin to read. Now, Paul writes here, I think he said to, to Peter's face, he doesn't mention Peter by name, but if we've read scripture, I think we know what he's talking about, right? He goes, all right, Peter, we're not gonna, I'm not going to fight you on this. I respect your authority. Remember, Jesus put Peter in charge. He's not going to go become disloyal and backbite Peter. Then he goes, and in his letter, he's going to write, oh, by the way, don't let anybody tell you that you have to be, that it's all about what you eat. Right? says, don't let people judge you by the following of rules. Now, it's interesting. It's, it's kind of a, an assumed fact here that he's saying, God's not judging you on this. Don't let people judge you on it. And people will try to judge you on whether you follow, whether they think you're doing all the things you ought to be doing as a Christian. Don't let people judge you. God's not judging you. Keep drawing closer to him. And you know, and sometimes the enemies, he likes to point out your faults. Just because he pointed them out doesn't mean that they don't exist. It's just, what do they mean? He can point out your faults, and he can remind you of all the ways that, that you fail and all the things that you don't do right, and he likes to, to bring those things to you. But you know, the difference between the Holy Spirit bringing something up to you to be dealt with and the enemy is how do you feel when it happens? See, God brings up by the Holy Spirit will bring things up in you that it's time to work on and it'll be an encouragement that he's ready. He's gonna come alongside you and work on that thing. The enemy brings it and he condemns you with it. When you feel condemned by what you've done, that's the voice of the enemy. When you feel, again, it's not always comfortable and pleasant, but when you feel, all right, it's time to work on this. Let's, let's, let's do this. This is the Holy Spirit bringing it up to you. There's a difference. All right, so don't let people judge you the enemy will try to get you to judge yourself. People will try to get you to, to feel judged. He says, don't, don't do it. Jesus nailed that to the cross. This, it's between you and God what you're, what you're working on. All right, let's go on a couple more verses. And ooh, we're gonna have to end there today. I, I got through about a third of one page of notes. Good. Let no one cheat you of your reward. 
taking delight in false humility and worship of angels and treating into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. There's a couple other places where Paul talks about this. He says that, that, that knowledge puffs people up. You notice people who get a lot of knowledge about things tend to get puffed up about their knowledge. And then not, it's not enough to be puffed up, then you gotta judge other people with the knowledge that you have. And he's saying don't let people do that, don't let people rob you of a reward that's rightfully yours. And why do I bring all this up? Because this is one of the lies, this is one of the weapons that the enemy uses. If he knows you are a believer in Christ and he can't change your eternity because you're a believer in Christ, but he can make you ineffective as a believer on earth, if he can get you to buy in to good religious sounding lies. With believers, he doesn't like to, to come out of left field with some crazy idea, pop some idea for some sin into your head. He doesn't usually work that way. He knows he likes to work on just twisting some truth just a little bit so it sounds right and it sounds like something you should do. It sounds like it would be good and holy to do that. And it's, it's never not good to do the commands of God. It's always good to do them, right? But if he can get you into believing that you're, you're falling short in those has now separated you from God, he's putting you back under an old covenant. He's putting you back in the old way of thinking that, that every action is separating you from God. Every inaction maybe separated you from God. He, he wants to bring these things into you. He says, don't, don't let anybody cheat you of your reward. It means that there's a reward, isn't there? It means that there's some things that we ought to be experiencing as believers if we'll change our thinking and put aside these, these weapons that the enemy is bringing against us to try to separate you from God. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm going to have to end there. So if you got anything out of that this morning, give the Lord a hand. We'll pick up next week.